All right, and welcome everyone uh, to the Real Leaders Podcast. Today we have on Jason Karp, the founder and CEO of HumanCo. Jason, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. So Jason, first question we have for you today is, what does being an impact leader mean to you? I think to me it really means um, changing the world for the better, uh, using the learnings, the knowledge, the resources, and the network uh, that myself and my team have built up over the years mm. to really make a difference and change the way people think about certain things, the way people do certain things, and the way people behave. Um, I think people in my position have a responsibility um, to leave this place better than how we found it. Mm. So that's what, that's what an impact leader means to me. You know, in the, the f- famous movie Spider Man, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. When did that realization come to you? Probably when I recovered from being sick. Um, you know, I was, uh, I was really sick in my early 20s. Uh, I was going blind when I was 23, and uh, I was told I was going to be fully blind <clears throat> when I was 30. Um, I ended up, despite everybody or all the Western medicine doctors telling me what I had was incurable, um, mm. I ended up curing myself through food and lifestyle, uh, which ultimately led my family and I to create Hugh Kitchen first, and now as sort of my second chapter, Human Co. Um, getting through that ordeal uh, and seeing how uh, sick all kind of modern humans are um, in terms of the amount of chronic disease, the amount of diabetes, the amount of heart disease, the amount of obesity, the amount we spend, which is in the trillions on healthcare costs, which could be going towards much better things, um, are all things that we can change. Mm. And having been through what I went through and basically kind of studying modern uh, living, consumer products, uh, nutrition, and environmental issues, uh, it's been pretty clear to me that this is all self-induced, um, and we can change it. Mm-hmm. But I think a lot of people aren't aware of it. I think there's a lot of education required. I think we need many better uh, products for people, which is what I've done with both Hue and Human Co., Um, and making it easier to live a healthier life. So for me, um, a a lot of it really stems from that period and recognizing how hard it is for everybody to live healthier. Um, And I view it as a a personal duty of mine to to help others now. Mm. And and like you say, you know, in American civilization, Western medicine was telling you this is incurable. Awareness being a big issue that we're talking about right now. What is the one question, the most important question you want the world at large to hear from this gathering? I don't think people are, um, you know, my focus at Human Co. is primarily on human health. I think right now we have many, many crises going on uh, across the world, you know, from a, a, a climate crisis, a human health crisis, we have a war going on. Um, I don't think enough people are asking questions about what's happening to human health. I think it is the greatest epidemic we have today. Um, I think it's the greatest threat to humanity we have today. I think we can't fix the world. We certainly can't prevent wars if we're all sick. Um, And I think because it's happening at a relatively slow pace, slow in the sense of people's lives, um, but really fast in evolutionary terms, um, I think people aren't asking enough questions like, you know, why are we the most technologically advanced, we exercise the most we ever have, we have more resources than we ever have, and yet we're the sickest, Mm. like empirically speaking. Like this is the first generation in recorded human history predicted to live shorter than Mm. the previous. Um, So not enough people are asking that question. Fascinating, fascinating. And and regeneration being a big theme at this conference. You You could talk about regenerative farming, you could talk about a lot of different business models are incorporating regeneration. Are you incorporating any factor of regeneration? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we are big proponents of regenerative farming at Human Co. Um, we, uh, we just launched a new product under one of our brands called Cosmic Bliss, 
um, that sources dairy from regenerative farms. Mm. Um, I think we're at a very critical inflection point in uh, food and agriculture where there are some people that are looking to what I'll call technology, which includes synthetic biology and biotech, um, to solve some of these issues. And there's other people that are looking at um, farms, nature, more uh, symbiotic relationships between animals, plants, the earth, and humans, which is really the essence of regenerative farming. Mm. Um, we are in the latter camp. Uh, I don't think you need uh, the kind of technology we're applying to solve some of these problems. I think we need a lot of solutions. Um, but I, I think we can fix a lot of our own problems uh, naturally. Mm. through rewilding, through regenerative farming, through recognizing that everything is interlinked. Mm. Um, and uh, I think that's a really important theme right now. And, and I think it's also why regenerative farming is becoming so um, uh, interesting to so many people right now, because it's something that, that worked a thousand years ago. Mm. It's not, it doesn't require you know, cutting edge technology to figure out how to work with nature, work with plants, work with animals in a symbiotic way. Mm. Uh, and you mentioned that, you know, Eastern medicine, kind of maybe open your eyes up to that, you know, literally and figuratively, I guess. Um, but, you know, at the same time, where did that experience come from? Did you have a, a visit over there? Did someone introduce you to Eastern medicine? How did you get this um, experience in this perspective? Yeah, I mean, back then, uh, this was in the year 2000, 2001 timeframe, which, uh, you know, a lot of what we're talking about was considered kind of woo-woo and, and uh, bizarre. Um, now I think it's well accepted and acknowledged that, you know, food can be medicine, um, that food's role in human health goes well beyond your weight or diabetes. Um, Back then, I just went down a lot of rabbit holes. I met a lot of interesting people. Um, there were a lot of people who are now regarded as top functional medicine doctors, but back then weren't really, functional medicine I don't think was really considered a, a, like an accepted Western medical practice. Functional medicine is really about um, treating the root causes of diseases instead of the symptoms themselves, which is the Western approach. It's just, these are your symptoms, here's some pills, make the symptoms go away as opposed to the root cause of the disease. And in most cases, there's a deeper cause for a lot of the diseases that are happening today. That notion of starting at the root causes actually is consistent with a lot of Eastern philosophy. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of practices that have been used for over a thousand years um, that again, weren't considered you know, scientifically accepted, things like acupuncture. Mm. Um, but now we're figuring out actually have a scientific basis as to why they work. So a lot of my uh, kind of revelatory experiences back then were really just um, the Western medicine dogma wasn't answering my questions. And so I just started turning over lots of rocks. Mm. And there were a lot of answers that came from more Eastern philosophies um, and came from areas of like what they now describe as functional medicine. Are, you, are there any medicines that are still have this dogma, still have this uh, negative lens on it that you still want to pursue and that you think Western should be more open to? Well, I think the greatest one is just food as medicine. I mean, I think um, there are so many things we can solve and cure through food. Mm. Uh, the, the problem is there's not really a profit incentive for big companies to use food as medicine. Right, pharmaceutical companies don't want to show you or tell you that you can reverse most diabetes through kind of paleo, keto, or even Mediterranean diets um, without using pills, without using exogenous insulin, without using all the kind of expensive treatments that exist. Um, so a lot of our chronic diseases that we have today are a function of our food and our lifestyle. Mm. And um, those can be reversed through food and lifestyle. And so I think that's probably the greatest area uh, where 
um, there's just not enough conversation around it. Mm. And, and in most entrepreneurs and CEOs' lives, you know, they haven't gone in alone. They've gone with the group. Uh, they've had support along the way. How has collaboration showed up in your life? Oh, I mean, I've stood on the shoulders of many giants. I've had a lots of lots and lots of help and lots of mentors along the way. Um, you know, I, I, I think this is a large collective problem that uh, we need a village. Mm. Um, and, you know, I don't think this is the kind of thing that an individual can sort of solve on their own. So for me, you know, this entire journey over the last 20 years for me has involved a lot of people, mm. you know, from my family to my colleagues, to people I've met in the industry, to many people here today at the conference. I think everybody has some consistent goals. Mm. Everyone's approaching it from different angles, right. which is great. You know, I think some people are approaching it more from an environmental angle. Some people are approaching it more from a human health angle. I think some people are approaching it um, uh, from more of a holistic angle. So I, I, I think the different approaches are actually needed. And the best kinds of collaboration are ones that have different mental models all coming in at the same problem with different ways of solving those problems. Mm. Well, Jason, thanks for coming on and sharing about your viewpoints and uh, about your experience today. Let's bring this home. What is your definition of a real leader? I think for me, it's, it's, it's walking the talk. I, I, I think, you know, I'm inspired by the leaders that inspire me the most are the ones that, that live the values they preach. Um, that have demonstrated that they've done it themselves. Um, and I think if you have the resources, whether it's time or money or relationships or skill, um, I think a real leader uh, has to use those to help create change. So to me, it's really walking the talk. Well, for Jason Karp, I'm Kevin Owers asking you to go out there, walk the talk, and always, folks, keep it real. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate Thank you. you.